I'm going to I'm going to record too. This meeting is being recorded. When you went, oh, I thought you couldn't hear me. <laughs> okay, so we decided that with each meeting, we would like to start off with some good news because as environmentalists, we're often uh, knee deep or even deeper, you know, in fighting lots of bad stuff. So, so the good news is um, the uh, Falls of James group uh, endorsed in a local race, a special election in Chesterfield County, Mark Miller for Board of Supervisors and Mark won. And uh, so he will now be the supervisor from uh, uh, Midlothian District in Chesterfield County, which will help uh, uh, improve that council's, that super, that board's performance, I hope. Uh, he'll still be outnumbered, but uh, one of the main issues he was running on was uncontrolled development. Uh, I also mentioned from the standpoint of good news too, is uh, um, um, Don um, McEachin, Donald McEachin, our Congressman in the fourth district that represents a, a good portion of this area, won re-election. And many of you, of course, know Abigail Spamberger who represented this district, uh, but her district was moved and she won in the seventh too. And and obviously the fact that the Democrats, I will put it this way, a climate majority uh, retained control of the Senate in terms of the people who passed the IRA with the, the largest amount of funding for climate measures uh, ever passed uh, remains intact. So many challenges ahead, but there are some good news there. The other thing I was asked to do in uh, Joe's absence was to recognize our uh, Green Giant awardees for 2022. And so with that, I'd like to uh, uh, go through those and I'm just gonna read uh, what they did because I think it's important to, to recognize that. And uh, I see Claudia is on line here with us. So welcome Claudia. Claudia Sproul uh, is a registered nurse with seven years of experience working in inpatient spinal cord injury and brain injury rehabilitation. Recently transitioned to outpatient family medicine. Uh, she brings her passion for community involvement advocacy and justice into the clinic and uses it to create change in how we provide health care. Uh, in 2013, Claudia founded Seeds of Change Organization, also called SoCo, uh, while living in Newport News. And SoCo empowers residents in low access, low income communities to pursue health, self-reliance and community involvement through gardening and other urban agricultural practices. Currently, Claudia is developing the Biggs Road Community Garden in Southside Richmond to increase access for fresh foods, uh, provide outdoor a classroom for youth, and bring residents together through green space. Um, in addition to serving on the board of SoCo, Claudia is a master gardener herself and serves as the 8th District Clean City Commissioner. She hosts monthly cleanups, volunteers with numerous organizations in the community, and advocates for her neighborhoods in the district. Claudia is a visionary and environmental champion, improving the quality of life for people in the city of Richmond. Uh, you can also find out more about SoCo um, at socogrows.org. And also, um, uh, if you look at the newsletter, you'll see her email address as well. So uh, Claudia, thank you so much for the work you do. And uh, we can't be really, uh, really let's applaud that effort there. And uh, we have a certificate here that uh, we'll get to you, okay? But uh, obviously, I, I can't do it virtually, except to thank you for your good work. Can we just ask uh, Claudia, just real briefly, for any comments? Um, let me find you, Claudia, and pin you for a second here. Any words? Uh, well, um, thank you all. Um, this means so much to me. Um, and also, uh, Rachel, who is, um, the backbone of SoCo is also here. So I uh, want to acknowledge Rachel and the work that they are doing uh, in the community. So thank thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's uh, uh, important work that uh, you do every day and uh, people in the community rely on you. Another one of our awardees is Mary Finley Brook, a person who I happen to know personally. Uh, and she is a, she is an associate professor of geography at the University of Richmond. Uh, as she notes in her Twitter profile, I thought it was, it summed her up perfectly. She says she's a teacher, a scholar, activist, and mom. Um, and if you follow her tweets, you'll see that all those apply. Uh, in a role as a teacher 
and a scholar. She's brought public attention to environmental injustices in Virginia and beyond the state. Um, as an activist, she has used her scholarship in environmental injustice to uh, become an effective advocate for marginalized communities of color that are disproportionately impacted um, uh, by both the Atlanta Coast Pipeline and the Mountain Valley Pipeline as good examples of what she's done. Uh, environmental justice concerns with the Atlantic Coast, Atlantic Coast Pipeline, specifically Union Hill Compressor Station in Buckingham County, resulted in a key permit being denied, which contributed to the defeat of that project. Dr. Finley Brook uh, was also one of the leaders in the establishment of the Virginia Environmental Justice Collaborative. And uh, uh, that uh, effort has successfully elevated environmental justice concerns in a number of permitting and regulatory decisions beyond the fracked gas pipelines. Uh, and VECA advocated for an environmental justice legislation that resulted in the establishment of an environmental justice office within the Department of Environmental Quality, which I might add our current governor is attempting to dismantle, but nonetheless, the fight continues. Uh, Mary would be the first to acknowledge that these victories are the result of frontline communities giving voice to historic injustices. But as a fierce and passionate advocate against injustice in Virginia and our world, she helped to amplify those voices. We're fortunate to benefit from Mary's activism in Richmond and in Virginia. And the Falls of James Group is very pleased to recognize Dr. Finley Brook as a 2022 Green Giant Award. I might also that recently she's been working to uh, get the students uh, at the University of Richmond involved in Fridays for Future efforts uh, each Friday. So. Um, investing in the youth and investing in marginalized communities. Thank you so much for what you do, Mary Finley Brook. And there's her certificate there, uh, which we'll get to you. Okay. Would you like to say anything, Mary? I sure would love to. Glenn, thank you so much. And everybody, um, it's such an honor. And um, I see the work. I don't know all of you. I know a lot of you. And I see the work that this group does supporting frontline communities. And so I know how important it's been to C5. I know how important it's been um, to communities that are receiving your support. So this meant that much more to me to be recognized for this, just knowing um, the work that you all do um, and seeing seeing your green up days and your, and your tree planting and, uh, and everything that I see people in this group do really makes a difference. But the long-term impact with the students at the University of Richmond, I've seen it for more than a decade and I really appreciate the mentoring. I appreciate the ways that you engage with those students and particularly right now, with the climate strikes, I've just been so appreciative of people in this group, the way that you've really um, been fantastic role models. So thank you so much. Um, I'm really honored to be here. Thank you for being here with us, okay. Uh, our third awardee is Barry O'Keefe and he's on uh, line here as well. Um, and Barry is a multi-talented visual artist currently teaching at the Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, in the arts department there, working throughout Virginia as an organizer who centers on social and environmental justice issues. And uh, if you are active in Richmond, you know, because you see his work there for sure. He's created many exhibits and galleries and at, at light installations as well. And you may have spotted some of his murals around Richmond, as well as large pieces of his work, a pipeline blockade in Southwest Virginia and at rallies in both Richmond and in DC. Barry was, uh, the founding member of Extinction Rebellion Richmond. Uh, Barry was involved in the advocacy work behind uh, Virginia Delegate Elizabeth Guzman's uh, House Dream Resolution on Global Warming Caused by Human Activity uh, as a Result of Climate and Ecological Emergencies. Um, that resolution passed the House of, of Virginia in 2020. And he also has worked closely with uh, Councilwoman Catherine Jordan of Richmond uh, on her Climate and Ecological Emergency Resolution, which passed unanimously August a year ago, in which we're still working hard to implement. Um, um, Barry continues to advocate for climate initiatives housed within that resolution. Uh, there's just a number of them there that um, uh, we're pushing the city to adopt. Uh, and he's doing that with his students and with uh, other Richmond policymakers. He was born and raised in Richmond. He received his BA, BA in English and Russian studies from the College of William and Mary in 2010. He earned a degree in printmaking at Ohio University. And uh, I know I've had the pleasure to, to see Barry in action here in Richmond and really appreciate his 
his good work. Uh, Barry, would you like to offer any um, any uh, statement? Um, thank you so much. It's um, such an honor to be uh, nominated for this by y'all. And it's been such a pleasure um, working with Sierra Club on these initiatives. <laughs> um, so um, I, I, I'm going to take the uh, funds that come along with this and give them to a really amazing organization that's getting started in the region, Third Act Virginia. If you're not familiar with their work, I strongly encourage you to check them out. They've kind of carrying the torch of XR Richmond as we've been in a bit of a lull lately. And um, I'm really proud of the work they're doing too. So thank you. Thank you, Barry. Siobhan, I think you're up next. You're up next. Okay, uh, Joe, I see Joe, our chair there. Do you want to say anything, Joe, before Carol introduces our speaker? I'm just oh. glad to be here. Thank you. I did get to see those all three of those presentations and thank you all. And uh, a note to Barry, I believe uh, our treasurer, who I see in the background, can confirm or deny this, but I believe the, that $200 has made its way to Third Act. Correct. And, uh, and we will uh, work with you both, Claudia and Mary, on getting the same amounts to organizations that you designate. Okay. All right. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Uh, Carol, go ahead and uh, please introduce our speaker for the night. It's my pleasure. Um, so I'm introducing Devin Jefferson, who has a very interesting title. He is the Community Science Catalyst for the Science Museum of Virginia. Um, he's a William & Mary graduate and joined the museum in 2020. Um, he's a strategic thinker and an authority on the process and the importance of citizen science efforts. So what is community science? It's a collaboration between scientists and public volunteers to gather new knowledge about the world. And Devin leads the museum's community science initiative on air quality. This is a program in which people of all ages can participate. You don't have to be a scientist and the information you collect helps the entire community. So Devin, the Sierra Club of the Falls of the James Group welcomes you and we look forward to learning more about how we can help with the museum's air quality initiative. Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, I appreciate the introduction and uh, thank you for for having me tonight. Um, I'm excited to get into talking about bio blitzes and other community science initiatives that we have. Sorry, that's okay. Um, and we are gonna I'll just gonna go through a little bit of our journey through for community science so far to kind of give some context around what community science is and how to get involved um, and some of the benefits and then I'll make sure to um, have time for questions um, as well. So without further ado, I'm gonna share my screen. And okay. I think if uh, everybody can see me, I'm going to get started. Um, so thank you again. Uh, so again, my name is Devin Jefferson. I'm the Community Science Catalyst um, at the Science Museum. And basically this, it, my job is to uh, run the community science programs and really be um, a liaison with the community and to help um, think through community science initiatives and the impact that they can possibly have on our community. Um, but before I get too far into that, I want to make sure that we're kind of on the same page about what community science is overall. And I know that citizen science is another phrase uh, that is often used uh, interchangeably with community science. There are some slight, uh, there are some slight differences. Um, the main thing, the, the main reason that we, especially at the Science Museum, um, are choosing to use community science specifically is because we want to emphasize um, that it is a community effort and you don't have to be specifically a citizen. So that's one, one of the reasons that a lot of people uh, are starting to shift towards community science um, as a title. Um, but as far as we're concerned, we have our goals and our, um, and our mission around community science. And a lot of it has to do with putting the community first. Um, you can see cultivating and sustaining strong partnerships with local organizations. Uh, and that means being able to go out to the community and, and 
invite the community into the museum as well to make sure those partnerships are equitable um, and and give and take. Uh, so they're they are um, equal partnerships um, as we intend as we try to increase science agency for participants uh, and museum staff. Um, and the way we do that is to make sure that we're uh, having opportunities available to the community, making sure that we're eliminating as many barriers as we can um, so that the community can learn a little bit more about science and how it how they can connect to it or how it impacts them as well. Um, along with producing impactful science information, we want to create, you know, want to make sure that people are um, continuing to ask new questions um, and be uh, curious thinkers about the world around them. Um, and ultimately, with community science, um, what you'll see a lot of is the goal, uh, one of the big goals is to increase capacity for civic engagement. And that means everybody involved, whether it's myself, whether it's uh, some middle schoolers uh, that, we're, that we're partnering with or that are coming to help us collect some air quality data. We want everyone to feel like they have the ability to understand what's going on as far as the science is concerned and be able to act on that, whether it's a large or small scale. But that's 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 where we are now um and that's that and all of that that list that we've been able to come up with to kind of help guide us on community science has started um back in really 2017 specifically um a lot of you might have known um or been a part of even of uh, our urban heat island initiative um, that was done back in 2017 so you'll see in the top left corner uh we have a couple of images of uh, some of the some of the um, the good feedback uh, that we got and the good attention uh, that we got around this effort, um, you'll see a couple of our our youth volunteers, our youth community scientists from the Groundwork uh, RVA um, collaboration, and you'll see uh, Dr. Jeremy Hoffman uh, down here jumping into action as well to measure that uh, that urban heat island effect, um, and that. The, the success of us being able to uh, collect heat data, to map it and communicate that data effectively to the community um, allowed us to be able to get to receive um, an IMLS grant um, in 2020, uh, really uh, effectively what was 2020. Uh, and that's where I come into play, where we were able to get that uh, Institute for Museum and Library Services grant to start RV Air. And that came out of a question, as we were talking about, uh, being able to engage with this project and then ask new questions. A lot of community members came to us and said, well, what about air quality? As they learned a little bit more about heat, we learned that air, that air quality is often connected to that. Um, and we also know that Richmond has um, a, has a struggle um, in the past uh, with, with having consistently rough air quality, much better now. We've gone. We've had a lot of efforts, a lot of um, policies enacted that have um, really increased the um, have really improved air quality um, in Richmond over the past few decades. Um, but as far as the heat island was concerned, just wanted to point out a couple of things that we were able to do was create this heat map on the left hand side of your screen, and this is data that was collected by the community. So what we're talking about, uh, what I'll talk about in a few minutes with um, things like bio blitzes and the city nature challenge that we're going to be doing. Um, this is the kind of visualization that we want to be able to create. It doesn't have to be a map of heat. It doesn't have to be a map of anything specific. It can just be a visualization, a representation of that information that we're collecting. And we're also able to have um, conversations connecting it to maybe local, uh, specific local phenomenon or, or local, um, uh, local qualities. Um, on the right-hand side, you'll see uh, a map uh, of Richmond Ambulance Authority responses uh, to heat-related illnesses. And you'll see that there definitely is an overlap. Not surprisingly, where the city tends to be hotter during heat waves, there also tend to be more calls or heat related illnesses. And that's just a, way, a one way that we're able to have this data connected to something um, that the community can really uh, connect to um, and really take as um, a connection for um, what the data is telling them um, and being able to apply that to something in their daily lives, potentially. 
Uh, the other way we've been able to do this, as I was saying, with uh, air quality is measuring air quality through um, RV air. Um, and that's uh, been the program. We're in year three of that now. Um, and we're going to be wrapping up at least the IMLS grant part of that, but continuing to collect air quality data. And we've been doing that through two ways with stationary sensors uh, on the on the left hand side, this purple air two sensor that's mounted at the Valentine in this picture. Um, in downtown Richmond, they're helping us collect air quality data. Uh, we also are using mobile air quality sensors uh, called Airbeam 2s. You'll see uh, these little ghost emoji <laughs> looking devices um, or pac mangas, uh, whichever, whichever pop culture reference suits your fancy. Um, but we are able to get volunteers to walk around with these sensors, collect data uh, mobily, and then also have a way to visualize that data and communicate it to people. These specific, uh, these screenshots are from the Purple Air website. Um, and this is, these are, each one of these dots is one of the, represents one of those stationary sensors um, like that's at the Valentine. Uh, and this was back, uh, back in 2020, this was when there were the wildfires burning out on the West Coast. Um, and so these air quality monitors are picking up all the smoke and debris from what was burning. Um, and we were able to see that. And we could see that West Coast, not so great. Turns out that uh, that smoke eventually made its way east. Um, and we, we did have a couple of days uh, back in August of 2020 where there were some unusually pretty orange sunsets. <laughs> um, and that, was, that can be attributed to uh, the large amount of smoke um, that, was, that was making its way across the country. But we can see that with this network of sensors, which is awesome. More visualization. This is just from the air casting website. Um, now this, these screenshots, there's a little bit more going on, um, but I just wanted to show what some of the different ways we can visualize this data are. The purple air sensors, you had the dots that represented individual, uh, the in individual sensors. In this format, um, the, the information that we collect while we're walking around or biking around Richmond um, is visualized on overlaid onto a Google Maps. So we can see as we're you know, walking, if you were able to go to this website, zoom in, you can get down to street level views of the air quality data we've been collecting. Um, and Long story short, we were able to use this data um, and that was able to uh, help support a paper that was recently published in an open access journal, um, scientific journal, um, which basically said, not surprisingly, walking through, uh, walking through the fan is a little bit less stressful um, and there's less air pollution um, compared to walking down the Broad Street corridor from the Science Museum, where there's a lot of cars, traffic, less shade, uh, it's a little bit louder. Um, so that is the very, very truncated summary of what our data helped support um, for, for this particular study. But we're really proud of being able to have this as an example of ways that we can use community science data for uh, public health, uh, for public health knowledge. Um, but before I get to, so, so I don't I make sure I don't go too far down the rabbit hole, let's make sure we're bringing it back to um, to the green, uh, some of the benefits uh, or some of the other community science projects that we have going on, like BioBlitzes and the City Nature Challenge. Um, so as we talk about uh, ways to use that data, you know, we like to talk about, uh, we like to highlight benefits of um, engaging in community science or some of the benefits of that data, you know, we can do things, we can say things like uh, investing in green space or green infrastructure, um, as we are doing at the Science Museum with our, uh, our new green space called The Green that'll be opening up pretty soon. Um, this is just one example of saying, hey, we can invest in green infrastructure that can help things like the urban heat island effect. Um, as we see down here, you know, benefits of trees, one of those air conditioning, another benefit, an air purifier. So we've talked about air quality as we've as we've learned more about our air quality nearby. But we also have things like animals, people that enjoy trees and green spaces. Um, so as we talk about that, you know, the one of the natural questions that we've gotten is, well, can we learn a little bit more about the animals that will also enjoy this green space? And one of the great ways to do that is a bio blitz. Um, so we are uh, the Science Museum is going to be 
helping to facilitate uh, the Richmond locate of uh, a Metro Richmond area's city nature challenge for 2023. Um, and what is the city nature challenge? It's basically a bio, it's a, it's a bio blitz that a lot of people across the world are doing all at once. And for those of you who don't know all the details a bio blitz is basically an event where we're focusing on finding as many different species um, in a specific area over a limited time um, as possible. And we're just going out into the into our neighborhoods, um, wherever we might be um, using probably iNaturalist, uh, as a lot of you pro uh, have have uh, used before. Uh, and iNaturalist is a great, a great networking uh, or a great system for collecting these observations, um, sharing it with fellow fellow naturalists, fellow community scientists, and also discussing your findings. Um, and so this is the platform that we are going to be using uh, for our for our bio blitz or our, our city nature challenge. Um, and that will be, uh, it'll be a great way to, it'll be a great and easy way to connect to this project um, and to contribute um, real, real-time data um, with us. Oops, I think I might have actually skipped a slide. Um, but what I wanted to say was uh, for those of you who also, who, who, are, uh, who might have participated with us last year, you'll know that um, Seek is a specific uh, app that, or is an app that was developed by iNaturalist as well. And it basically truncates the process um, or it shortens it's a it's a much easier app to use um, on the go than the full iNaturalist app. And basically, I just wanted to show some uh, some screenshots of what that looks like for those of you who might not be as familiar with it. Um, but Seek is basically like using Google Lens. If you if anyone has ever tried that out, um, maybe on their phone, if they have a Google phone, they know that there's a function to search things based on their picture, and that's what this app does. Um, and you can add your object, it connects directly to um, iNaturalist. So if you have an account already, um, you can post it, uh, you can connect that to your Seek uh, through the Seek app, you can connect to your iNaturalist account. And that'll be even easier, uh, an even easier way for you to upload your observations and add your observations to the project that'll be going on in April. Um, well, this was slightly redundant, um, but sorry about that. Uh, just to, to make sure, yeah, I just wanted to point out uh, what that looks like in the Seek app as well. But iNaturalist free, as most of you probably know. Um, and as we're talking about the City Nature Challenge specifically, why does that, why does something like the City Nature Challenge matter? Um, the City Nature Challenge has been a, uh, an ongoing project since 2016 or a, a recurring event since 2016. And it was established by um, the, uh, sorry. Uh, it, was, it was established um, as a collaboration with the California Academy of Sciences and the Natural History Museum um, in LA. And it, I just wanted to show this graphic because I think it's super impressive uh, the way this project and initiative has been able to grow over the years. And it really does highlight uh, how impactful something like community science can be. Um, now, as this, when the City and Nature Challenge started, it wasn't specifically for the purpose of community science. Um, it you know, comparatively is more of a citizen science initiative um, when it started. But depending on how that information is applied, as we've talked about uh, a little bit before with the way we can use um, urban heat island data and air quality data, that information can be used in a variety of ways. Um, and it can be used to inspire a lot of different things. So you can see that the number of cities started with two in 2020. Uh, sorry, in 2021, um, there were over 400 cities that were participating, over a million observations, and that's just over the three-day period of the City Nature Challenge. Um, now, the City Nature Challenge, like I said, is a, a much more complicated and, and uh, an intense version of a bio blitz, but one where you're collaborating worldwide. So remember, these are worldwide numbers. Um, and when we were able to participate um, in a more <laughs> official capacity last year, just wanted to shout out these numbers as well, that we had 445 cities around the world uh, participating, uh, or we were uh, one of those 445 cities 
um, that participated last year and were able to collect over a million and a half observations, um, including um, some endangered species, whoops, um, and including being able to uh, capture and observe uh, a large number of endangered species and things like that are important uh, when it comes to being able to uh, track maybe maybe we have some rare some rare species that that are hiding um, in our neighborhoods that we might not have known about or that other scientists who are looking for them might not have known about um, those are just you know super uh, some relatively small anecdotes but nonetheless they're important uh, to really contextualize um, why things like the city nature challenge are important and why it'll be a great uh, a great opportunity for uh, for this the this community members of Richmond um, to get involved as we get as we get that rolling next spring it'll be right around Earth Day um, so keeping that in mind um, I just wanted to um, really uh, so keeping that in mind uh, as we look forward um to april of next year april into may of next year around right around earth day the science museum is going to be uh is going to be helping to coordinate another city nature challenge for the richmond area and uh with this qr code here uh will you uh if you are able to see this on your screen um you can use your camera um you can use your phone camera to um so scan the QR code and it'll take you to a Google Forms where you can just fill out some quick information, your email, um, and to get on a, basically an information, uh, to get more information as we start to get our plans together, um, you'll be able to hear from me with updates um, and a much more in a more official sign up specifically for the City Nature Challenge. So right now, this is more for gathering information. And I'm also going to put a link in the chat for those of you who might not have phones or might be looking at this on your phone. Um, so I'll be able to provide that link as well. Um, but with that, I wanted to make sure I'm leaving time for questions and comments um, and discussion um, and to say thank you. Thank you so much for letting me uh, for, for having me this evening and for um, being able to share a little bit more about the community science program um, and the city nature challenge that's coming up next year. All right. Thank you very much, Devin. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, does I'm anybody have sharing. any questions? Oh, yeah. Oops, okay. Sorry. Go ahead. No. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so does anybody have any questions? You can just unmute yourself if you want to ask uh, Devin a question. I, I know that I'm really interested in um, coordinating with you because I'm one of the outings leaders for our group. And so I would love to, you know, have a group of, of uh, Sierra Club members engage in a group activity with you, um, you know, but collecting data. Where do you usually go when you collect data? Or what, where did you go last last year? Yeah, uh, last year we we had a couple of uh, smaller uh, data collection events like on our campus, um, and that was we, what we wanted to do is have uh, a little bit of a baseline. So we were able to go collect some data uh, or some observations um, just before we tore up the parking lot uh, that was out front of the side of the Children's Museum. Um, so uh, we got some baseline data before we uh, did that. And now that the green is, we have the grass, we have trees planted and we're, we're really close to being able to have that open to the public. Um, we'll be able to collect some before and after data. Um, so for now, it's we've stuck close to home um, with our with the museum campus, but we did have partners, um, a couple of other partners at Lewis Skinner um, and uh, Groundwork and a, and a few other um, smaller, smaller organizations that were, they were able to organize their own groups um, and kind of get together that day and do things on their own, like in their own neighborhood. Um, and I, I had a couple of friends who just decided to go outside and, and submit some data uh, that day, and it all counted toward the City Nature Challenge. So do people typically work in teams or pairs? How, 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 do, you, how do you organize the structure of it? 
Yeah, uh, it's been a pretty loose structure for now, uh, just because with COVID and the pandemic, it, it we, we had to make sure we were super flexible. Um, but honestly, I think uh, with with, with what, the way we want to do it is we would love to be able to host people, especially during Earth Day, um, so we can do it in larger groups. But some people are more comfortable going out and doing things on their own. Some people just, you know, live um, in, in an area where it's easy for them to walk outside and just kind of go collect data on their own or, you know, make those observations on their own. Um, so it's really up to the comfort level of, of the person, you know, participating. We, we're definitely going to make sure that we have options available um, that, that, that can accommodate people's preference, but really it's, it's open-ended, which is nice. And will you be providing guidance? Like if you have, say, oh, yes. if, if you've got six people who live in the fan and only one person say who lives in Craven Court, are you going to try and uh, balance things out in, in terms of places with heat islands versus places which are, which are less, less heated like the fan? Ah. Uh, so we haven't, uh, I hadn't thought about, uh, we hadn't thought about targeting areas based on the heat island data or some of our other projects, but that's a really good, that's a really good thought and something that we can definitely incorporate, but definitely, we definitely are going to have training sessions where we're, we're going to make sure that there are opportunities available for people to learn how to use, uh, to, to use iNaturalist and, and seek as well. I had a question. Um, you mentioned that there were some policies that had been changed as a result of some of the data you collected. Can you share with us what some of those policies were, what some of those changes were? Oh, uh, so in, in general, uh, there have been policies enacted that, um, that have helped reduce, oh, so for example, um, in Scott's edition, um, there were, there was you know, a, a very no, well-known shipping, um, you know, sh industrial shipping area, um, and a lot of the, uh, a lot of the ship, the semis uh, that were usually delivering foods, especially back to the Dory Foods area, a lot of them would just sit there and idle uh, during the day while they were doing their thing. Um, so that was one so that was just one instance that piqued someone's interest and said, hey, uh, that seems like something that, you know, we might be able to do something about. But what had to happen first was uh, they had to collect air quality data. Um, so this, this was a while back, but eventually what happened was there was enough data collected that was uh, able to, uh, to support um, the, um, to support the, basically change of instituting a no idling zone um, back there. And that was just one, you know, a small example of the way uh, that data can be used. Another example is um, using the heat island data to, uh, for that same area, uh, for Scott's edition, to advocate for some of the pocket parks uh, that are being put up over there. So the little tiny green spaces that one of them I know is across the street from, um, from the daily bar or what used to be. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Daily Bar, and uh, another one that's out on Broad Street near Shepherd, uh, near Broad and Shepherd. Um, I know that that's, that was another sm uh, small green space, um, but th that, and that was just another way that some of that data has been used. Um, and then for, for air quality, a little bit longer conversation so far, since we're just now kind of really getting into the nitty gritty of collecting uh, the collecting data. So we'll hopefully be able to find some partners um, that can help us with with using that air quality data down the road um, as we as we continue getting feedback from the community of, of ways they would like to see it used, especially. Um, we have okay, one, I, a question in chat okay. and we also have Linda Redmond has her hand up. Yeah. Uh, yeah go ahead, Linda. Yeah. Um, you you gave broad national we can't hear you linda sorry you faded out while you're getting back online let me um mention that gwen parker said you talked about trees what about leaf blowers and the damage they can do to the air quality and noise levels um let's see when uh, can you can you elaborate on that just a little bit about uh, about what you mean? Are you able to? <clears throat> so so can you hear me? Because I got yes. my things in. Okay, so 
every time they're using gas ones in my neighborhood and they're incredibly loud and i know that they're they're emitting pollution mm -hmm. um more so than the electric ones which are equally heinous uh as far as noise pollution goes but is there any law about prohibiting those or anything we can do to to discourage people from using them Ooh, that is a good question um that's not that's not something i'm not i'm not sure how uh much our particular project um would be able to help with that but it's definitely something that we can ask a little bit more about just because i mean if you're collecting data I mean, can you collect it before they start blowing and then after they start yeah. blowing? And so I one th one thing we can do, yeah, uh, one one option um, that comes to mind at least is hosting um, one of the purple air sensors, which is the state the stationary sensor. Um, that is an option. Uh, the one the one downside I would say to what our particular devices can do is, or one limitation for our devices, is that uh, our sensors are only. Uh, reading how much particulate matter is in the air, they're not really saying what specifically is in the air. So I think that would probably be one of the limitations that might make it a little bit harder. But um, hosting a purple air sensor or even just having one of our, our um, mobile sensors uh, to see if we can pick up those, those, those uh, spikes during the times when they're using them. Because you're right. They are giving off fumes. There, there is, there are, there is byproducts when you're using them, especially noise or or gas um, from the uh, from the air, from the leaf blowers. But it might be a little tough for for our sensors specifically to parse through whether it's from the leaf blowers or from something else. You know, if that, if that makes sense. Darn. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. We can one day, one day we hope to have some sensors that are that are a little bit more uh, a little bit more precise. But I know with uh we're we're getting there. It's just gonna be might be a little bit longer. Okay. Well, okay. I'm over <laughs> All right, thank you. Um let's see, Jill uh Auburn. Oh, I'm sorry, Pam. Well, let me go to Pam first. Pam Kimball said, I'm with the Virginia Master Naturalist. Can you keep us in the loop when you want volunteers to help? Yes, absolutely. Um one of the one of the good ways to do that is um uh is signing up for the just the in the signing up using the Google Doc, and I see someone has thrown it into the chat. Uh thank you, Lee. I appreciate it very much. Um and yes, so if you sign up, that will help you keep, uh, that'll help me keep you on my radar. Um, and then you'll also see, you'll also start to see um, a couple of emails come out from me it's recruiting just with the community at large. So that'll, that'll definitely be another way to, uh, that I will probably be blowing up your inbox a little bit. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, fantastic, because uh, there's uh, the Riverine chapter, I'm with the Pocahontas chapter, and we have lots of volunteers who want to help do things to help nature. Yes. And I awesome. think one of the problems we have is not knowing what you need for us to do. And and okay. our and our membership is uh, a combination of uh, people who are just interested in uh, social science, but also of scientists themselves. So. Um, yeah, if we can just get on some sort of list and yes. keep in the loop, we'd be fan that would be fantastic. Absolutely. Th thank you for for pointing that out, Sue, because I know that's something that uh, we are trying to focus on as the as the museum, um, just making sure that we're not letting uh, as many opportunities and and groups fall through the cracks when we're looking for <laughs> for engagement, um, since there are so many groups that are already out there that are already interested and even in some cases doing similar projects. Um, so we're, we're trying to make sure that number one, we're not stepping on too many toes, but also catching, um, catching as many people as we can. So thank you. I will definitely keep you in, um, on, in the loop. Thanks. Okay, um, thank you. Um, uh, oh, Glenn, yes. Yeah. yeah, I just out of curiosity, <clears throat> I know that I can go to Purple Air, I think, and find the, the, the air pollution data for the Purple Air monitors, but the other handheld monitors that you have, I was looking on your website, I didn't see any link to the uh, to the air data there. Gotcha. How, do I, how do I access uh, your other, those handheld monitors you have? Yes, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put a link in the chat in just a second. 
because so what, what I'm going to do is link, uh, throw a quick link to the air casting website. Um, and from there, that'll at least be able to get you to the rest of the data. So the air casting website is, is called uh, the habitat habitatmap.org. Um, so sometimes that's, that's why it might not show up on that first Google search. Uh, but yes, if you give me just one second. While you're doing that, I'll just say that uh, we, uh, some of you may have joined us on a, a bike uh, trip we did uh, on Sunday uh, with Devin and Lee and uh, some folks from Seacan and Sierra Club uh, uh, and Richard Nelson, is it? Um, or Rob Nelson uh, from University of Richmond talking about the heat island effect and redlining. And it was a great, uh, great outing and uh, a lot of good information conveyed. So thank you, Devin, for participating in that yeah thank thank you for having me again that was a lot of fun um i got a chance to to really uh break in my my e-bike <laughs> so i was thankful for the opportunity to do that um but in the in the link uh i shared a quick so this is just a truncated link but it'll take you to uh the air casting website and it'll look like actually you know what if i share my screen just really quickly just so, just so you know where, where we're going. Um, please ignore all the tabs. But uh, this is this is what the the website will look like when you go to it as the default. You can play around with the parameters on the left hand side, um, as well as adjust some of the the um, the display colors, like the, the thresholds for the colors um, at the bottom. But this is the website where you can go to, you can download any amount of data that you really want to, um, similar to the Purple Air website. Um, so I won't go into too much detail because I know it's a, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit dense for now, but this is at least uh, the website, the uh, aircasting or habitatmap.org. Uh, just to follow up, I, I know that uh, uh, there has been some EPA work done relative to air emission, air exposure, air pollution exposures, uh, communities closest to interstates, for example, from mobile sources. Has your data picked up any of that? Because, and of course, you're, you're only looking at particulate, but, but I know there's lots of other nasty things, heavy metals, et cetera, because obviously the closer people live to interstates, the more likely they are to contract cancers, for example. Um, that's some new data coming out of the EPA. So I'm just curious whether you've taken a look at that or whether any of your PM data picks up uh, uh, proximity to highways as a factor. Uh, it yes, we can reasonably uh, we can with reasonable certainty attribute it to uh, proximity to highways in certain situations. Um, and it's, when it shows up on the map, uh, usually it's pretty clear uh, how close uh, that sensor is is to the highway. Um, and we do uh, have, so for example, when we're over in um, the uh, Randolph area, uh, kind of like near Idlewood and Petronius Park, um, we can, as we're walking across that bridge or across the, the um, um, 195, the expressway um, into the Bryant Park area, we can definitely pick it up a little bit, um, but it's hard to, it's hard to parse through, yeah. I would say we definitely see the differences because there are elevated uh, PM readings closer to highways on average. Um, and not surprisingly, when you're further away, those levels tend to drop down. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was a long, that was a long winded <laughs> answer to your question. <laughs> and I just uh, saw a comment here from Daryl about the uh, lawn, the leaf blowers, he said, under the electrify everything concept, leaf blowers, lawn mowers, trimmers, etc., will be electric and a lot less noisy. So yes, right. that's good. They're they're less loud, but the pitch is higher. Uh, if that makes any okay. sense. That makes sense. Well, I guess they won't be polluting though. <laughs> <as much. laughs> I know. I mean, pollution wise, yes, but I mean what. Anyway, Baby if they're steps. planting trees in the city, are they deciduous trees or evergreens? Uh, that now that is definitely a, a case by case basis. Um, are you or do you mean specifically for the green at the museum? I'm talking about the little green places you were just talking about, the pocket parks. Um, 
are they and now i am they... i'm not sure uh that's a, that, that is a very good question i don't yeah they're i don't really, want to be irresponsible and, to, and put my foot in my mouth <laughs> they're making an effort to put in native trees so um and we've been involved in two tree plantings and we didn't plant any evergreens but uh but uh, they are all native trees yeah the yes i knew the, the emphasis is definitely for native species Okay, I just saw Linda come back in. Linda, do you want to try to ask your question if you are there? I apologize. I lost power for a minute. And um, oh, no. yeah, the whole house, we lost power and it took me a minute to get things back going. So my apologies. Yeah, you, you presented national data. Are you finding, um, is there anything specific in terms of that you found illuminating about the results for Richmond specifically in terms of either hot spots or biodiversity? Um, let's see. Uh, so far, not yet. Um, we haven't, we didn't have a, a ton of data for, well, so we had some, uh, but nothing that would indicate anything unusual. Um, we just had, you know, observations, at least for this past year. And that was because we were we kept it relatively small, um, so we we didn't have quite the spread um, uh, for for a number of participants that we did. But hopefully this year will be different, or this coming year will be different. And you never know, we might we might find something uh, that we might find something unusual or or at least interesting and noteworthy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions for Devin? All right, well, well, thank you so much, Devin. Um, as we talked about earlier, um, uh, you're for your honorarium, for your nice presentation, we would like to give you a $50 certificate. And you said you'd like to like it to go to the Boys and Girls Club of Greater Richmond. So thank you for, for um, that offer, um, for you know, contributing to that worthy group. And thank you so much for all you do. And I'll definitely be in touch with you about um, you know, trying to coordinate with you and, and getting an activity going for the Sierra Club during the BioBlitz uh, period of time. Absolutely, awesome. Thank you so much. I very much appreciate it. Okay, uh, thank you please so feel much. Free to, please, please feel free to email me or follow up when, uh, if, you, if you have any other questions. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, all right, yes. Okay, Joe, um, let's see, there you are. I'm going to Oops, I think I accidentally muted you. Sorry. Um, would you like to give some announcements? I would love to. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. And let me. Uh, <laughs> that, pull... that helps with announcements. Okay, let me pull up the announcements real quick here. Um, sure. And while see, you're I doing that, Siobhan, I, uh, I have them, so I can go ahead, but I was going to throw in one that we did not have on the list because I thought of it, and it is the first one chronologically. I thought it would be good to mention that this weekend at Bryant Park, the annual In Light Art event is happening on Friday and Saturday nights uh, from 7 to 11 p.m., and of course, uh, Friends of Bryan Park are great partners with the Sierra Club and doing good things in the city. So if you have a chance this weekend, I think Bryan Park should be a, a wonderful venue for the In Light event. Uh, and we have advocacy updates. I guess we are gonna start with from Lee. So uh, the advocacy committee is one of our most uh, active entities. And we would love to have uh, anyone who is interested join us in our advocacy committee meetings. Uh, as you see there, we are uh, involved with community groups, with citizens who are opposed to the siting of two sheets gas stations, one in Henrico County on Staples Mill Road, that one is across from the Amtrak station, basically, and in a place that is currently wooded on eight, eight or nine acres that are currently wooded. The other is in Stratford Hills neighborhood of Richmond, uh, right on a corner of Forest Hill Avenue. There are petitions on Facebook and Twitter. And everyone who lives in the city of Richmond should have received an action alert 
this weekend asking you to send a message to city council members and the mayor advocating for the priorities of a coalition called the RVA Clean Energy and Climate Justice uh, Policy and Budget Recommendations. These are efforts we're trying to make for the 2024 budget because the city per, uh, goes through its process so far in advance that what we've learned is to have an effect, we have to get involved early. So uh, please check your email for that action alert and uh, follow the directions and uh, communicate with your council person and with Mayor Stoney's office. Uh, there is a link there for that. And uh, we, the advocacy committee and all of us are greatly discouraged that Richmond Public Schools fleet manager opted not to even apply for electric school bus grant, which was available and Richmond, I believe was a priority location for this. We did not even try to get any electric school buses in this uh, grant process. So uh, Lee Williams, our advocacy committee chair would love to do something to enlighten and change the policy of the Richmond public schools on this issue. Those are some advocacy announcements. Now we have, uh, I'm gonna go to the actually continue in chronological order and mention that on November 27th, we have a hike in Pocahontas State Park. That is Thanksgiving weekend. And so, as it says humorously, if you wanna burn off some of those calories, please join uh, Ralph Grove, our outings chair and our chapter chair at Pocahontas State Park, 10 a.m. on November 27th. We got the date right there? All right, Fab <laughs> fabulous, that is always helpful. And then our other announcements on the screen had to do with our upcoming uh, programs. In December, we have a virtual program. This will be, I think, the third year in a row where we do a bit of a travelogue. Members uh, show images and describe trips they have taken. So we have Ralph Grove speaking about hiking in Turkey. We have Lydia Pittman talking about traveling in the Harz Mountains of Germany. And we have Glenn Bessa about camping and paddling in Newfoundland. That's a virtual meeting on December 13th. So please join us for that approximately one month from tonight. And then as we go into the new year, we have our program set through April. Uh, as you see there, January, we have urban gardening, backyard and community growing our health and ecology with our own members, Lydia Pittman and Lisa Thompson. In February, we have, uh, for the second year in a row, University of Richmond student environmental presentations moderated by Dr. Todd Lookingville. Uh, this was a great program last year and I anticipate it will be again. I see that's on Valentine's Day, which is interesting. And in March, we have a program on wildlife corridors. And in April, the return of one of the two speakers that we had about monarch butterflies. And uh, they also did a tour of the garden for us in South Richmond. Uh, Carl Green is a fantastic speaker and we are very glad to have him coming back in April to talk about fast fashion. So that is what's coming up as we get down towards the end of this year, 2022. I'd also like to really thank Carol Ribley for arranging tonight's speaker and uh, introducing him tonight. And I would like to thank Glenn for making the Green Giant Award presentations and Siobhan for doing incredible amounts of work to plan all these programs and set them up. And, uh, and in fact, she did a lot of work to change tonight, uh, not uh, 
to change tonight to being a virtual program, not that this was all uh, her idea, I would say I will take <laughs> credit or blame for that, but we did feel it was best to shift to a virtual program tonight. And Siobhan does incredible work on all of these programs. And of course, last but not least, thank you, Devin, for being here with us tonight and speaking. So happy holidays, everyone. And please join us again in December for the travelogue. Thank you everybody for coming. Appreciate it. Take care, everybody. See you Thank next you month. Your <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay.